and get started. Uh, again, good morning. My name is Rocky Moretti. Uh, Moretti is spelled M-O-R-E-T-T-I, and I'm the Director of Policy and Research with TRIP, a nonprofit located in Washington, D.C., an organization supported by a coalition of transportation organizations that look to us to put out the latest information on the condition of the nation's transportation system, both the physical condition of the system, its reliability, and critically, its, its level of safety. Today's virtual news conference, after I give my comments on the finding of the report, we're going to hear from three North Carolina speakers. We'll hear first from Gary Salamito, the president and CEO of the North Carolina Chamber, from Natalie English, the president and CEO of the Wilmington Chamber of Commerce, and then Joe Bost, chief advocacy officer with the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance. Following those remarks, we'll, we'll open it up for questions if you indicate uh, through the, the chat function or, or raise hand function that you have a question, then my colleague Carolyn Kelly will elevate you to the panel so that you can interact with us normally with any questions or follow-up questions. The report itself is really is based on, on several sources. One is the latest data available on the condition of the state's roads and bridges on level of travel and also looking at traffic safety freight travel and levels of traffic congestion. During my initial comments, I'll go ahead and also provide data for the Charlotte and Research Triangle area, but we do have data available in the report for all urban areas and in the question and answers, if you, if you ask me for the additional uh, regions of the state, I'll go ahead and give that just in the interest of time. We also will have this on our website, a tape of this immediately or shortly after the news conference and we also have short videos with information for each of the five regional areas that uh, are, will also be on, on our website. Let's look to, to the key findings of the report. The report finds that with North Carolina continuing to experience significant levels of growth, that really the state looking forward, North Carolina faces a significant challenge in providing a reliable, safe, and well-maintained transportation system. Recognizing the tremendous need for additional transportation investment in North Carolina, in 2022, the state legislature put in place a long-term boost to transportation funding that beginning in 2022, over the decade following that, is going to provide an additional $7.2 billion for transportation investment in the state. This is complemented by the 2021 passage of the Federal Infrastructure Investment and Jobs Act, which combined has allowed the state to increase investment in its bridges by 17%, excuse me, in its road improvements by 17% and in its bridges by 22%. But unfortunately, this is being impacted in terms of, of the impact of this additional funding uh, we've seen a significant increase in inflation and highway construction costs. And unfortunately, this has diminished to some extent the benefits of this additional funding or, or have limited in terms of the additional investment. <clears throat> over 2022 and 2023, over that two-year period, there was a 43% increase in highway construction costs. So certainly that's had a significant impact on the scope of the state's system in terms of it, its ability to move forward with critical projects. We point out in the report that since 2000, North Carolina has had a 35% increase in population. This reflects a high quality of life and a strong economy. But as you anticipate, this is also putting a lot of stress on the state's transportation system. From 2000, to 2019 in North Carolina, we saw a 37% increase in vehicle travel. And then of course, there was a significant reduction in vehicle travel across the state during the early parts of the COVID-19 pandemic. And by 2023, vehicle travel in North Carolina had returned to within 2% of pre-pandemic level as the state returned to really a, a level of travel similar to pre-COVID. We have seen in terms of traffic congestion across the country that traffic has come back somewhat different. We're seeing across the country, evening rush hours are back to pretty much pre-COVID levels. We're seeing a somewhat lower level of morning congestion, and we're actually seeing some midday traffic congestion. And Saturdays in, in many 
urban areas, traffic congestion is as bad as it is on a Monday, typically. And so we have seen travel come back, but somewhat different. <laughs> the report looked at the physical condition of the system and found that approximately one third of North Carolina's major roadways have pavements in poor or mediocre condition, which costs state motorists $5 billion annually in additional vehicle operating costs. These costs in, include accelerated depreciation as a, of a vehicle is obviously it, the more stress it operates under the quicker, the quicker it's wearing out. Uh, and we also see increased routine repairs, fuel consumption, and also tire wear. In the research triangle area, the report found that 15% of major roads have pavements in poor condition and 24% are in mediocre condition, which is costing the average motorist an additional $623 annually in additional vehicle operating costs. In the Charlotte area, the report finds that 23% of major roadways have pavements in poor condition and 27% are in mediocre condition which is costing the average area motorist $784 annually in additional vehicle operating costs. The report also noted that 7% of bridges in North Carolina are rated in poor condition. These are bridges in need of immediate repair. They're not closed, but in some cases they're restricted to lighter weight vehicles because the inspectors have found that while the bridge can still continue to carry traffic, it has significant deterioration. The report also found that 52% of bridges in North Carolina are rated in fair condition. These are bridges that need additional routine maintenance to make sure that these bridges do not fall into poor condition. The report found that in the research triangle, excuse me, the report found that 5% of bridges in the research triangle area are rated in poor condition and another 50% are rated in fair condition. The report found that in the Charlotte area, 5% of bridges are rated in poor condition and 52% are rated in fair condition. The report also looked at the impact of reliability, essentially the ability to get places in a timely fashion. And the report found that annually, the cost of traffic congestion in North Carolina is approximately $4 billion annually in the value of lost time and wasted fuel. In the research triangle area, the report found that the average motorist is spending an additional 36 hours annually stuck in traffic and wasting 14 gallons of fuel due to traffic congestion, costing the average motorist $863 annually in the cost of traffic congestion. In the Charlotte area, the TRIP report estimates that the average annual motorist is spending an additional 48 hours annually stuck in traffic and wasting 20 gallons of fuel due to traffic congestion, costing them $1,319 annually in the cost of lost time and wasted fuel. The report also includes a list of the 25 sections of highways in North Carolina that are the least reliable for motorists, but also for, for, for truckers as well. Uh, this includes segments of US Route 16, 29, 51, and 147, and the state's major interstates, including interstates 40, 77, 85, 277, and 485. The report also notes that North Carolina, along with the rest of the country, faces a significant traffic safety crisis. And we've unfortunately seen this crisis actually get worse beginning with the pandemic. And that's true also, unfortunately, in North Carolina. The report found that from 2019 to 2023, 7,858 people have been killed in traffic crashes in North Carolina. And we note that the rate of traffic fatalities at 1.38 traffic fatalities per 100 million miles of travel is higher than the national average of 1.26. We also note that over the last five years, 17% of traffic fatalities in North Carolina are of pedestrians and bicyclists. The report also notes that what we've seen in North Carolina, unfortunately, is what we've seen across the country where traffic fatality numbers have actually worsened since the COVID-19 pandemic. In North Carolina from 2019 to 2023, we saw a 10% increase in traffic fatalities in North Carolina. 
We point out in the report that the U.S. Department of Transportation has put in place a comprehensive holistic strategy for improving roadway safety across the country. And this is based on an approach that includes certainly safer drivers who are obeying traffic laws and, and not being impaired and staying within speed limits, but also safer vehicles and also improves roadway safety features as being a significant factor in improving traffic safety, not only for motorists, but also for pedestrian and bicyclists. The report also points out that $741 billion worth of goods are moved annually to and from sites in North Carolina, and the state is significantly reliant on the health of its freight transportation system, particularly its highways. The report includes a list of the worst traffic bottlenecks for freight across North Carolina, which includes most of portions of the state's major interstates. In conclusion, the North Carolina Department of Transportation with the additional resources that have been provided both from the legislature and the federal government have pursued a number of projects and programs to improve traffic safety. It includes since 2018, $6.2 billion to increase the capacity of numerous highway segments across the state. And there's a list of those projects in the report. The helping to, to manage four regional and one statewide transportation management centers, which work to make sure the system works efficiently as possible. Also supporting a safety service patrol network on major portions of highway, which annually is helping 37,000 stranded motorists. Certainly a tremendous help to the motorists and also keeping them safe, but also very helpful in terms of the reliability of the system. Support for retiming traffic signals, which again is very critical in improving the reliability of the system. A complete streets program, which seeks to improve the walkability and also the safety of bicycle lanes across the state where they're appropriate. And finally, working with the state's 25 and 80, uh, 25 urban and 80 rural transportation transit systems. So I'm gonna conclude there. Uh, by pointing out that North Carolina, as it continues to grow, faces significant transportation challenges. And providing a transportation system in North Carolina that keeps people safe, provides reliable access, and is a well-maintained system will require additional investment in the state's transportation system. With that, I'll turn it over to Gary. Uh, thank you, Rocky, and uh, thank you to the trip for uh, the the relationship and the partnership we've had for years, Joe and Natalie. It's always good to be to be with you and to work with you to help keep our state and our communities competitive with it. So uh, thank you all, and thanks for those of you that are joining the call today. And at the at the North Carolina Chamber, uh, we do four things. Our mission is around four things: research, develop, uh, educate, and communicate about those policies and those solutions necessary to keep North Carolina uh, the best state in the country, if not the world, to live, work, raise a family, and to do business. And transportation infrastructure is essential. Uh, in order to get people and goods and raw materials and products to and from markets and to and from work and to and from school safely is essential to a growing state. Uh, our state has a dynamic economy. It has growth. It has retention. It has all good things going for it right now. And we're on the top of our game. But as we know, the best time to change your game and to make those critical infrastructure investments is when you're on top of your game. And right now we have the opportunity because of our, our good growth and because we're a great state for business to, to make those critical infrastructure investments. Uh, safety and efficiency, right at the top. You know, business is about people. And people are the are the folks that are going to those important works, uh, excuse me, jobs in manufacturing, in the service industries. Uh, we have to make sure they can get there safely. We have to make sure their kids can get to school safely. Uh, we have to make sure that our first responders uh, have access to the routes that are necessary to take care of us. Literally, lives depend on it every day, as, as the report points out about how important those investments are. We see a shrinking uh, gas tax. Uh, Cars and, and vehicles are getting more fuel efficient. That means that the gas tax that we relied on so heavily for so long uh, is less predictable. Uh, it's less sustainable. It's volatile. And we need to have uh, more predictability and more diversification in our funding sources 
in order to make sure we make these investments, not only for uh, the workers of today, but for my children and grandchildren uh, to make sure that we, that when they have an opportunity to live and work in North Carolina, that uh, we're continuing to be that place that they need it, they need it to be. We thank our state leaders. Uh, they've made those critical investments. We, we thank them for their foresight. They've been making those and understand the, the important role of diversifying our revenue sources. Uh, but the time to do more is now. Uh, we need to continue to do more now. We need to continue to diversify our revenue sources in, in order to make sure that we can meet the safety needs and the growth needs of our businesses and of our citizens all across North Carolina. Uh, if we continue to place such a heavy emphasis on the gas tax, uh, we'll fall behind. You know, uh, North Carolina, thanks to the good work of Joe and Natalie and others across our state, was number one in business two years in a row. And But this year we came in uh, second. And uh, we don't like to look at that as losing. We like to look at it as Virginia caught us. And one of the reasons that Virginia caught us is because of the infrastructure investments that 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 they made in Virginia. And uh, we're we're ready to make those investments and to lead again. Uh, so thank you for the opportunity today. Uh, you know, we know that the, our elected officials know that the dire challenges we face, but also what opportunities that we have. And we look forward to working uh, with our local communities, with our elected officials, with TRIP. Uh, to make sure North Carolina continues to be the top space to live, work, and raise a family through investments in our infrastructure and our transportation network. Thank you, Gary. Uh, Natalie? Thank you, Rocky, and, and to the team at TRIP for including me today. And um, I'd also like to thank Gary for the leadership that he and his team provide us at the state level. Uh, th it, that partnership is critical because that allows we local chamber folks to focus you know, hyper focused right on our local communities. And I would say that uh, our perspective is a little bit different from others across the state, uh, much like Asheville. Uh, and I see that Kit Kramer is on the call today and uh, from the Asheville chamber, uh, we have geographical challenges uh, that, that, cause additional time and effort in permitting um, and being sensitive to the environment and sustainability. Uh, we also face uh, disasters um, on the coast and in the mountains that some of our folks in the Piedmont areas don't face. And so ensuring that our infrastructure is sustainable and resilient through those storm events in 20, what was it, 2018, when Hurricane Florence came through, New Hanover County was a complete island because roads had washed out or were flooded to the degree that we couldn't drive vehicles between New Hanover County and the mainland, so to speak. And so we we have uh, been excited to see some of the investments that our state DOT has been able to make in those uh, the infrastructure in those corridors. So. We hope to not find ourselves in that place again. And yet, uh, certainly there are others, right? Um, from that uh, geography perspective, um, one of our biggest priorities is replacing the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge, which is long past its, its life. Now, kudos to DOT for continuing to make investments so that we know we are safe crossing the Cape Fear River on that bridge. And yet, uh, from a capacity perspective, Southeastern North Carolina is one of the fastest growing regions in the country. And so we know that people who live on the other side of the Cape Fear River come to Wilmington for entertainment, for uh, restaurants, for their health care in a lot of cases. And so ensuring that the capacity um, through the Cape Fear River Bridge is 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 flowing continuously. So we we hope that that bridge will be high enough to not require any sort of lift whatsoever, and that traffic will continually flow across that bridge. Uh, we just we are really thankful for the advocacy that that Gary has led with his team and and the rest of the local chambers across the state for those new resources for transportation revenue. We cannot continue to expect that we can keep up with our state's growth, continue to support the commerce and the economic growth that we see coming if we don't ensure that we have the revenues to invest in the transportation infrastructure. Um, I thank you again, Rocky, for inviting me to be a part today. Thank you, Natalie. Joe? Uh, thanks, Rocky and Gary and Natalie. It's always a pleasure to to be with y'all. Um, the partnership that that we enjoy um, 
is is tremendous. And I don't know that there's a week that goes by that uh, one of us is not talking to the other about transportation. Um, and it's because it's a critical component of our success in North Carolina. Uh, you heard Rocky highlight some of the, the facts about growth. Um, I want to share a statistic that just came out the other day. We have 117 people moving to the Charlotte region every single day. Uh, so our belief at the Charlotte Regional Business Alliance is economic growth in North Carolina and the Charlotte region is it's contingent upon a modern and efficient transportation network. We've got to make sure we've got ongoing investments in our roads and bridges and transit systems uh, to uh, to make sure we're maintaining and enhancing the infrastructure that, that really support the state's dynamic uh, development and continued economic vitality. Uh, look, we... Uh, we're grateful for the the partnership with the North Carolina General Assembly. Them uh, providing additional revenue to transportation has been uh, fantastic. But we have an opportunity to to blaze a trail um, in North Carolina and do things uh, a little bit differently. Um, looking at uh, how we fund transportation at a statewide level and and then even uh, a more localized level here in the Charlotte region, we're contemplating a comprehensive transportation plan uh, that would look at um, levying additional 1% sales tax um, in Mecklenburg County. That's contingent upon legislative uh, engagement and authorization. So we still got a ways to go, but the potential is, is $25 billion over the next 30 years between local and federal funds that could potentially be um, uh, put towards roads and bridges and infrastructure and transit systems. So we've got a tremendous opportunity both locally in the Charlotte region, but also the statewide level to really blaze a trail uh, and, and showcase uh, how forward thinking North Carolina really is, whether it's on transportation or economic development. Um, it's going to be crucial to our long-term competitiveness and success. So um, again, Rocky, thanks for the opportunity. Gary and Natalie, it's always good to be with y'all. And uh, I appreciate the opportunity. Thank you, Joe. Uh, Carolyn now will explain how we're going to proceed in terms of questions. Thanks, Rocky. My name is Carolyn Kelly. I'm the Director of Communications for TRIP. At this point, we'll be able to have a brief Q&A where uh, those media in attendance can ask questions of our panelists. Uh, the way that will work is you can either use the raise hand function on Zoom, or if you'd like to submit your question in the chat box, um, I can either then promote you to a panelist, so you'll be able to ask your question live um, of our panelists, and we'll be able to see and hear you, um, or I can also read the question uh, myself if you'd prefer not to be uh, a panelist. So as we wait for some questions to come in, I'll also just let everybody know that the full report is now up on our website. You can find that at tripnet, T-R-I-P-N-E-T dot O-R-G, where you can download the full report as well as regional news releases, and we'll also have a recording of this news conference up on our website in the next 30 minutes or so. So you'll be able to access everything there. I do see uh, one question that has come in from Eric Spanberg. Uh, Eric, I'll promote you to a panelist. And in just a moment, you'll be able to ask your question of our speakers today. If you go ahead and unmute your line, Eric, you can ask your question. Great. Can y'all hear me okay? Yep. Yeah. Right ahead. Okay. I'm uh, I'm sitting in traffic, so this is an appropriate setting. Um, for, for Joe and for Natalie, I'm curious, how do you take information such as the findings in this study and put it to good use for funding uh, and to encourage more funding for uh, transit and transportation? Joe mentioned the conversation is obviously underway here, but both of you are almost constantly involved in these kinds of discussions and campaigns. So I'm just curious uh, what kind of educational value you think this has for residents and businesses. I mean, from my perspective, Eric, and and um, I know Natalie has a lot to share here too. Um, I think it's about adding to the drumbeat that we've already been talking about for years at this point, uh, Eric. I mean, I, I talk to policymakers every week. I know Natalie does the same and, and Gary does too, about the pain points that we hear from uh, uh, CEOs from across this, the, the Charlotte region. And now Natalie and, and Gary talk to them across this state as well. 
about the important issues. And so the the more we can uh, have uh, reports like this that really confirm what we've been telling policymakers for quite some time, that we've got to do something uh, now, um, the better. And so um, I think the, the TRIP report just provides yet another data point to, to back up the conversations that Natalie and I have, uh, Natalie and Gary and I have with policymakers across this state. Um, and, you know, local policymakers too, let's not forget, you know, our city and county leaders, um, those who participate in the, you know, the MPOs, right? Like these are the sorts of uh, data points and reports that that we need out there um, to, again, back up uh, all the, the conversations that we've been having. Yeah, and Eric, um, I would add an additional um, analogy, if you will, um, the squeaky wheel gets the grease, right? We <laughs> um, we know that we that our, our elected officials at every level hear from so many people about so many different issues. It's incumbent upon us to use the information that things like the trip report every year provide us so that we can keep transportation infrastructure investments top of mind for those legislators. And it's it's just, it, it, it's an ongoing effort. We've been really fortunate with our partners, um, Gary's team at the State Chamber, the communications team and their government affairs team create assets um, that we can share. We also spend a lot of time, Joe and I, uh, educating our members about these things because our members also have relationships with elected officials. And so we will share information with them, encourage them when they have conversations with all of our elected officials to, to also uh, toot the horn and, and squeak the wheel, if you will, so that we can get the funding that we need. Thank you both. Great. Thanks, Eric. And we've also got a question from Mary Smith in Asheville and uh, Rocky Mary would like a breakdown if you've got it handy of the data points for the Asheville area. Sure. The report finds that in the Asheville area, 11% of major roadways have pavements in poor condition and 16% are in mediocre condition. The impact of poor roads in the Asheville area is costing the average motorist $428 annually in additional vehicle operating costs, which includes accelerated depreciation, additional routine repairs, and also additional fuel use, and also tire wear. The trip report finds that in the Asheville area, 8% of its bridges are rated in poor condition and in need of immediate repairs, and another 61% are in fair condition and need ongoing maintenance to help them avoid falling into poor condition. The report finds that in the Asheville area, the average motor is spending an additional 34 hours annually stuck in traffic and wasting 13 gallons of fuel annually due to traffic congestion. This costs the average motors in the Asheville area $849 annually in the cost of lost time and also wasted fuel. Thanks, Rocky. Uh, our next question comes from Sean Gallagher. Uh, Sean, I've elevated you to a panelist as well. So in a moment, you can ask your question. You just need to unmute your line and then you can go ahead. All right, great, thank you. Um, so I had uh, two questions here really quick. Um, one, how does uh, North Carolina compare to the rest of the country as far as roads and bridges? And then also, how do you balance the idea of, you know, expanding roadways to help with congestion while also keeping in mind traffic safety? Sure, well, let's look at, look at overall conditions. If, if you look at, at pavement conditions statewide, uh, pavement conditions are, are, are close to the national average, maybe actually slightly better uh, than the national average. So then you really you look at regionally, whereas the report points out that the, uh, the greatest share of pavements in poor condition are, are in the Charlotte and Wilmington area uh, and, and more typical of urban areas. And what we see across the country is typically urban areas have worse pavement conditions. And, and that's a function that they're more heavily traveled, uh, including freight travel, which puts obviously a lot of wear and tear on the system. If you look at bridge conditions in North Carolina with 7% of its bridges rated in poor condition, that is, is right on the national average. 
The, the challenge with bridges is just as really with pavements as well, as they get older, you reach a point of diminishing returns where routine repairs aren't as effective as they once were. And if you can't stay on top of that with, with a, a high level of investment, then you're looking at reconstruction, which is a lot more expensive. And then probably the area, uh, two areas where, where North Carolina uh, clearly is above the national average. One, is, unfortunately, is traffic fatality rate is higher than the national average. And the amount of vehicle travel growth based on population growth from 2000 to 2018 was among the highest in the country. And we now start to see that growth return post-COVID. Now, the, the, the second question, just, just repeat it, because I want to make sure I get the get it correctly, Sean. Yeah, for sure. So um, with trying to you know fix any traffic congestion issues, I would imagine that will include some expansion um, and, you know, having more cars on the road, uh, potentially allowing people to go at higher speeds. I would imagine that um, you need to take traffic safety into account for that. When you say traffic fatalities are among the highest in the country here, how do you balance that keeping the roads safe while also trying to expand for traffic congestion? Well, I think you would hear from a state transportation agency, but also from a local transportation agency that, traffic safety is the priority. And traditionally, anytime we see a roadway or a bridge improved or, or rebuilt, it comes back with improved safety features. That, that said, as the report points out, 17% of traffic fatalities are of pedestrian or bicyclists. So a significant share of traffic fatalities as you anticipate most of those are urban traffic fatalities. And so it's really, as you, as you rebuild and improve your transportation system, certainly your urban transportation system, where you have a lot of, of pedestrian travel, but also bicycle travel, increasingly what we're seeing across the country is taking greater care in making sure that your, your, your pedestrian and bicycle facilities are as safe as possible. And, and, and obviously the, what that means is, is reducing or eliminating the, the, the interaction uh, between vehicles and pedestrian and bicyclists. And, and certainly intersection design is critical to that. And there's a lot of, of analysis and study into designing intersections as safely as possible. So it's really, we have the playbook for making the system safer, but it's critical that you have the resources so that these transportation agencies can make those safety improvements. Thanks, Rocky. We have another question from Ava Dorn in Wilmington. Uh, she asked if you could touch on the data sets for the Wilmington area. And she also asked about the condition of the Cape Fear Memorial Bridge um, and if there are plans plans for repair or if it is leaning towards poor condition. Rocky, if you take the first half, I'll take the second half. Perfect. Thank you. Thank you, Natalie, because I that was beyond my expertise. So I'm glad that you can address that. The trip report finds that in the Wilmington area, 19% of major roads have pavements in poor condition and 27% are rated in mediocre condition. This is costing the average Wilmington area motorist $661 annually in additional vehicle operating costs, which includes accelerated vehicle depreciation as a result of driving on rougher roads and additional routine repairs and additional fuel use and tire wear. The trip report found that in the Wilmington area, 3% of the region's bridges are rated in poor condition, and another 34% are rated in fair condition and, and need additional improvements to ensure they don't fall into poor condition. The, the trip report found that the, excuse me, uh, the trip report found that in the Wilmington area, the average motorist is spending an additional 28 hours annually stuck in traffic and wasting 11 gallons of fuel annually due to traffic congestion, which is causing the average motorist in the Wilmington area an additional $660 annually in the cost of lost time and also wasted fuel. Now that I'll let you take the second part of that question. Thanks, Rocky. So, um, Ava, um... What we know is our bridge is safe. We can continue to cross it. And in fact, you might remember earlier this year, we closed down one side uh, coming into Wilmington and we had to route ourselves way around town to get, to get across the river. And then um, after that, 
uh, improvement was made, we then closed the other way, the way out, and we had to um, make our way around the city to get out of town across the river. That was so that DOT could invest a lot of money in keeping our bridge safe for our crossing. The um, I would say that the, the, the replacement is really more about modernizing and expanding capacity for a bridge. So as, as Rocky mentioned uh, to Sean's question about safety, every time we are we have the opportunity to reinvest in, in infrastructure, we can make it even safer based on new uh, information and new research that leads to even better materials invested in that infrastructure. Right. Thanks, Natalie. It looks like we've got one more question uh, that says, uh, with the future completion of the I-26 interchange in Asheville, how does that affect our numbers of poor or mediocre conditioned roads and bridges? Well, really, I, I think that the more significant impact will be on the reliability of the system in Asheville. And so you you would anticipate, and we, we've seen this with, with other projects, that really what they then allow with additional access is, is obviously improved mobility uh, and also improved safety along with that. I would suggest not that I know the particulars and certainly um, Kit Kramer, who I mentioned earlier, um, can certainly answer those questions. But in addition to um, those safety improvements, it also when we add infrastructure in our regions, it it offers an opportunity for that reinvestment in existing infrastructure because there's an alternative path of travel while our transportation agencies make those other investments. That's a good point, Natalie. Thank you. I believe that answers all of the questions that we see uh, for right now. And again, I'll reiterate that the full report is up on our website right now. We've also got, in addition to the report and the regional news releases, we'll have a recording of this uh, news conference if you missed any, any portion of it. We've also put up there regional videos for each of the five urban areas that provide a brief description of the road and bridge conditions and safety conditions in each area. So if you're looking for a quick data rundown for your area, you can also find that on our website. Well, I want to thank all the speakers again for taking time out of your, your morning to be with us. And, and, and certainly want to thank everyone uh, who attended uh, today's news conference. And uh, we hope that this report and uh, the messages in the report help uh, North Carolina continue to make further improvements in its system. Thank you. Thank you.